I was not aware of this case from 2015, but I would have remembered it if I was, uh, you know, I just wasn't in a good place at that time, so I wasn't watching the news and things like that, so I didn't remember this. But this is a really, seems to me crazy that it is not solved at this time. And, and it's still active. There's a private investigator, last I checked, who was looking into it, um, who had already been working on it and then stopped. And, uh, you know, he's depending on some GoFundMe money to be able to come back. But this is a little boy who was two and a half years old. His mother and father were, in, were uh, engaged, I guess, at the time. Um, they decided uh, to go camping, but it wasn't really their decision to go camping. It was the mother's grandfather who really wanted to go to this park. He hadn't been there in 30 years. It meant something to him. He enjoyed going camping and fishing. He had a friend who was quite a bit younger than him um, that he had somehow be befriended along the way. Um, and decided that you know he would go too evidently the two of them didn't really have a whole lot in common but went fishing and things like that together from time to time and um the grandfather had told his granddaughter that he was bringing him he said he's kind of odd but uh he's okay he's all right so let we'll bring him and so they went up to this spot about 30 minutes maybe or longer, maybe an hour away from where they live. And they brought their, their truck, which had a camper attached, or had a camper in tow. Um, and what else did they bring? I think that was it, because once they got there to this campsite, it was late at night, it was like 10 p.m., so it was dark. And they start a fire, they put up a tent uh, for the friend, I believe the friend slept in the tent that night and then the rest of them slept in the back of their the truck or something because there, there was a mattress back there. I guess the truck had a cab on, I don't know, or the SUV. So they uh, got everything else set up the, the next morning and then it was the next day in the afternoon that the child disappeared. It's just the four of them all four of them say they don't know what happened to the kid. It's a this area where they put the fire pit, it's one green field. It's just one field, you know? It almost looks like it's elevated, right? So you drive in on this very rocky, very bumpy dirt road that my car couldn't make it up that road. I imagine it makes a lot of noise with any cars coming up that road. It's very rocky, you know, you, when cars do travel that road, it's it's uh, you really need to have something that can handle that kind of a road. One road in, run road out. That's that's the only way in. So, it but the, this part of the ground looks elevated a little bit, and there's a big fire pit in the middle, and so they pulled up around the fire pit and, and formed a sort of semicircle. And um, when you go along the edges of this area, in some places it's a deep drop not a very long drop but a deep drop and there's some running water and this was the middle of july and what they're saying is that there was water that was according to the dad the there was water it was running but it wasn't moving very fast but you could hear the water moving and then there's a reservoir that at the time he said had three or four feet in it um so and lots of woods. I mean, lots and lots of woods all the way around this particular area that sort of looks like it was cut out right there. And it's the road coming in sort of just stops right there. And this was the first time that the parents, uh, well, the dad had said, it's the first time he'd been there. He'd never been to this particular camping site. But that he and, and, and uh, I guess the wife, she never really commented on the camping site. But she and the the little boy... Uh, evidently had been camping elsewhere, you know, 
uh, but this was their first time at that site. They didn't know the lay of the land. They didn't know um, how everything happened. But it, the initial stories that came out from each one was that the parents walked away from the campsite. And the initial story said, the grandfather said he was in the camper with the door open. And that the friend had walked away to go fish. So he wasn't even there at this moment. And the, so the two parents wanted to go out and check out the area or go fishing down at the river. And they left the little boy, two and a half, Dion, there with grandpa. And what they're saying is that he was there and they asked him if he wanted to go fishing. This is according to the dad. Do you want to go fishing with us or do you want to stay here? And he turned to walk back to grandpa. And so they said, she yelled and said, Grandpa, we're leaving Dion. We're going down fishing. And evidently he said he didn't hear that. So they turn their backs and they walk. And that's the last anybody sees of them. But later stories, the grandfather says, I saw him playing in the dirt and something about candy and uh, uh that was it and i mean the stories have changed from all of them and uh so what i did was you know i went through and started digging i was surprised and shocked at how this unfolded and i'm going to show you a picture of the key players the four that went on this camping trip that none of them have any idea what happened to that child even after every inch of that ground was searched but i do have to say about the search um it's possible that i couldn't fathom uh, searching every inch of that ground and not coming across something. A boot, a shirt, um, if there was a body, you know, a, even a two and a half year old, you would immediately, you know, notice these things. But in this area, there is a lot of downed trees. There's, you know, not even far from the campsite, there's brum bramble, there's, um, you know, it looks like things that have washed down from, from the hillside, got caught up in the, in the movement of the water. They had divers, they had um, used, you know, all the latest technology to deter, detect any kind of uh, human bodies. Um, they had cadaver dogs, they had uh, other uh, scent dogs, they had trail dogs, they had every single kind of dog out there. Um, also, like immediately the turnout to search for this child was full on. So here are the four that were on that trip. So you have, there you have the mother, Jessica Mitchell, the father, Vernal Dior Kuntz Sr. The great-grandfather, Robert Walton, he's the great-grandfather of the little boy, and Isaac Rein Reinwand, he was the friend. So, and I have the sources, I, if I remember, I'll put the links in, uh, in my description, so you can go back and watch the videos of the parents. Uh, the uh, There wasn't a whole lot of video of the grandfather, but there's video of uh, the friend, the parents. There's, there's a few different interviews that they have done from the day that he went missing until today. And um, there's a, a really good special that kind of sums it up. It, missing, it, it's not, you know, it's just a short special. It was on Headline News. They had a series, Real Life Nightmares. And season one, episode three, 
is about this case and you can get it on Discovery Plus or I think the ID channel also has it in in uh, archive but there's four seasons I believe now first season episode three you can find that too I'll, I, if I remember I'll put that all on here but um, this all started uh, in 2015 like I said they went up there to uh, Timber Creek campground and, uh, and this is all in Idaho and so uh, set up their, their their camp arrived late on the 9th and then the story was that when the parents came back from their fishing and this was their initial interview uh, that they did with um, East Idaho News KTVB and you may recognize this guy who interviewed them. His name is Nate Eaton. And he's the one that also did a lot of reporting on um, uh, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell in the initial uh, news of that whole situation. He was front and center. So, um, so the four of them head up to... Uh, uh, Timber Creek Campground uh, in uh, Limai County and um, walk away from their child, think Grandpa's got them is their story, and come back and they said, you know, where's Dior? Grandpa said, I thought he was with you. And they're like, no, we left him with you. And he's like, oh, I thought he was with you. And uh, evidently, whether the friend was there or not at that time, the story has changed. The friend said he wasn't there. The friend said he was there with Grandpa when Dior uh, was there. Um, the friend confirms that Dior was at the campground with them because the private investigator gets involved um, after the police... Uh, don't turn anything up. This private investigator gets involved. Initially hired by them, by the family, then fired and then rehired by extended member of the family uh, to come back. Um, so through the searches, initially um, they had professionals and volunteer crews on foot, horseback and ATV. The 911 call was made from the mother at the campsite. The father was at the time of this 911 call, he said a half a mile or a mile down the road in his truck trying to get a signal to call 911. I don't know if they proved that to be true or not, <clears throat> but she made the phone call. It came from her. Um, at the actual campsite and she told them where she was she said he was missing about an hour at the time of her call so you know news gets out pretty quick volunteers show up uh, divers in wetsuits the SAR helicopter search and rescue helicopter with heat range um, you had people on foot you had people on ATVs you had people on horseback um, they scoured the site and they actually spoke to someone who was there who said i worked on this i searched this for three days with everybody else and there was not an inch of ground that was not turned over within a couple of mile radius like the search was intense um they don't say if they looked at the truck if they looked at the camper if they looked in the tent None of that is mentioned as having been searched. The friend, evidently, when you when you circle, like I went down so many rabbit holes that have to do with this case, the friend never left his tent. According to the mom in the latest interview, which was like 2019, she said she suspects him because there was a lot of red flags. The red flags are he sat in his tent, the whole time they were searching, did not help search, drank beer, and what else did she say? Oh, he did not like the idea that the kid was along for the trip. 
that he had made the comment, why'd you bring him? And um, so that's her red flags. The father in the 29 in, in, in interview also points towards him. Um, the private investigator suspects the parents, but he really zeroed in on grandpa. And grandpa passed away in 2019, but he said because when he was interviewing him, he wet the chair while he was interrogating him. And to grandpa never said anything other than he felt responsible. Towards the end of his life, he said, you know, he felt responsible because he didn't keep an eye on him and he felt really bad about that. Um, but never confessed that he knew where the child went or that he had anything to do with it. He went to, he went to his grave with that. Um, the first interview with the parents was uh, via KTVB. And I watched the unedited, the uncut uh, version of it. And my first reaction was, um, the guy is, is loud. The father, he's loud. He's overbearing. His wife or a, a girlfriend, the mother of the child, uh, never gets a word in edgewise. She seems very meek. And when he she would speak up, he'd talk over her and just drown her out. He, he can completely... Uh, became the focus of that interview and like my notes here are loud and dominating uh, talks over wife interrupts her his explanation again his explanation about the 911 call was odd to me initially and that was their first thought like everything that was said in that initial interview by him um, s reminded me of Trezell and Jacqueline and they, these two also said, yeah, we completely understand why people think it's us. I would think it was us too. And that's exactly what Trezell and Jacqueline said. Um, is that a normal thing to say? I don't know. I think it's reaching. I think that's someone reaching in a way I can't explain it, but it, it doesn't sound uh, like that's a, a normal, like you're going to, these people are coming after you, like the public is coming after you, the police are coming after you, and you're going to say, I understand that. <clears throat> and the dad said, he's a mover, like he, when he, when he goes, he goes fast, but he does not leave his parents. He never leaves his parents. And that is something else Trezell said and Jacqueline. These two are rambunctious. They're going to be rambunctious, whatever that means. And with this motion, they're going to be like, that was the one thing he had total confidence in saying. This guy too, he's a mover, but he does not leave his parents. He never just wanders off. And the mom says, the mom's holding his blanket. The blanket you see in this initial picture, you see him with the three things mom and dad said he never left behind. He went everywhere with them. His blanket, his cup, and his monkey. Never goes anywhere without them. They were at the campsite. He never wanders off or goes anywhere. He's always close to his parents, but he, he went somewhere. He wasn't with them. And the dad changed his age. Like at first he said he was two years old. Then he said he was three years old, but he was two and a half. I don't know why. And, um, at the time of this interview, they were aware that there was a woman at the the only like little shop store called the stage shop in that area that said she saw him with the son. The son was crying and he was dirty and that they were in there and they went, they left and got into a black truck and he has a black truck and their, their uh, reasoning for that was, 
Um, I drive a black, here's the thing. I drive a black truck. I don't know the area. That wasn't me. And then eventually they changed their timeline to fit that the three of them went down there to get something. Uh, that was a later story. Um, and, and they said that when they had left the campground, they were gone for 10 minutes. Uh, Trezell said they were gone for 10 minutes, right? He turned around, he went inside um, to take the wood for, for Mrs. Little House on the Prairie so she could, you know, continue her hallmark image of wrapping presents. Well, they said they were gone no longer than 10 minutes. Very emphatic, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Turned around. So I guess they weren't going fishing. They said they were going fishing in one story. They said that they were going exploring in another story, but they turned around after 10 minutes. And if you see this campground area, that doesn't make sense. So that's the, that's the area where the road, I think it ended right there. Um, you see uh, Nate Eaton is, you see him standing there because he went through, uh, when I put these links in, he goes through the campsite. The third picture is, I know it's blurry, but it's a dirt road that they drive in to get to the campsite where you see the cars and stuff. So the parents said they walked down that dirt road and were only gone for 10 minutes. Um, they ruled out any kind of attack by an animal, even though there is a uh, wolf den in the area. Bears have been seen out there um, and other wildlife, but according to what uh, Dior was wearing that day, he had a little camo jacket. Um, he had on cowboy boots that were one size too big. And this is according to his parents. And um, was he wearing a hat? But anyway, um, they ruled out any kind of animal attack because there would have been some kind of uh, evidence to that effect would have been left behind and namely the boots if he and and to me it's not mentioned anywhere but he would have been screaming if an animal had snuck up and like a wolf or something and and snatched him at the campsite uh, or walking down that dirt road he would have been screaming and if they were only 10 minutes away uh if they had you know number one i think that they were gone if this is a true timeline true story they were gone longer than 10 minutes. They were off in the woods doing the nasty or, you know, whatever, exploring and weren't concerned about the kid and weren't concerned about what was going on in the campground. But that kid would have been screaming and there would have been evidence that there was a tussle between an animal and a child. The boots would have gone flying. Um, so there would have been blood evidence there, you know, um, they didn't find any of that. And, and the reason that, that, that becomes an issue is because of the onslaught of searches that went on. I'm telling you, they searched under everything. And annually, they search. There were three private investigators at one time that were working on this case that did their own searching, did their own interviews. I'm not, sometimes I, like because of the, the Daniel Robinson situation and that PI, I sometimes 
think that the PIs go into it looking for a specific result. And, you know, the notoriety, the in a big case like this that had, evidently it had media attention. There were a couple of different specials made about it, like on headline news, and there was one other one. Um, the amount of attention that this got in the PIs, you know, they, they got a business and they want to solve it or they want to say that they, this is pointed in, uh, I don't know, I'm not always 100%, um, you know, all in when it's a, a public case like this and the PIs want to get involved. Um, if they solve it or if they come on strong and they're on the... You know they're on the news um, because they inject themselves or because they contact social media. I I sometimes question that because you do have legit search um, groups like EquiSearch and um, the other Water Crew. Um, I'm not talking about the Jared Water Crew. I'm talking about this other Water Crew. Uh, it's an elderly retired couple. And I really should remember their name because I called them about Orin and Orson. Um, they do it because of their own personal stories that led them to, you know, um, create this kind of a, you know, their own pain and suffering um, put them in this position to want to help others, you know, and it, it feels like they, it gives them, um, they don't feel like they're sitting idle on their, on their own unsolved cases and, and losses and things like that. So when a private investigator pops in and immediately starts pointing the finger, um, and, and making statements and this one private investigator that they initially had hired and fired, and he's still on the case. Klein Investigators and Consulting um, said they would return at twenty thousand, the twenty thousand dollar market GoFundMe, because they need money to stay in, in motels and and things like that. Um, they're very determined to point the finger at the parents. They think they're lying. They have come out with statements saying that uh, they lost their apartment because they couldn't make payments. But if you listen to that, you're going to think, you know, the parents are guilty. But you have to, and they might be, but you have to take into consideration too. They got kicked out of their apartment because they couldn't make rent. They lost their jobs. Um, this, As this case became more and more public, she had two other children that she gave to her ex-husband because she knew she couldn't afford to take care of them. And, you know, but it depends on how you, how you angle the story, you can make it look, you know, a certain way. So he's saying she didn't want her other two kids and this was the only one she had. She didn't want him either. So she got rid of him. Um, maybe, I don't know, but he kind of put that out there as, as, as a solution to this crime. Um, and yeah, I agree. Like the behavior in that first interview was was very strange, and it it reminded me of uh, Trezell and Jacqueline West. But even with Trezell and Jacqueline West, I wasn't a hundred percent sold that that they had anything to do with it. Um, maybe I'm too I'm open minded to a point that it's not good. <laughs> I don't know. But I tend to want to listen to, but I wish I was like face to face in person talking to people about like talking to Trezell and Jacqueline face to face at that time. I wish it was me, you know, um, because there's there's definitely a way that you can angle in a interview that they feel uncomfortable and just keep talking and they and they, you know, they say things Um it might they might not incriminate themselves like directly but you're you're kind of paying attention to how they're responding to you and and that sometimes uh can help uh explain an innocent person or also bring up more um suspicious points 
So um, you see by the search pictures, when that, that guy, which his, I think his name was, what was his name? David. Um, he, he said, we searched every inch. And he was a part of it for three days. Every day. His name is Bobby. Searched and left no stone unturned. Literally, no stone unturned. There was no evidence. But then, like I say, did they go to the truck? Did they go to the camper? Did they look in the tent? Did the family even say that they looked in their own car, the camper, under it, the tent, where the friend never came out and helped search? Were those things ever, ever checked? Were those things ever confiscated and checked? I'm just saying that is missing. That is missing. Um, you see where that, it's not a clear picture, but where that dirt road is, where the parents walked off, that's the only way in. And that's the only way out. And it's a very rocky road. And um, you would hear other vehicles approaching. Uh, in a later interview, the two of them said they saw some strange guy in that store, that they were in the store with their son. Um, you know how I said they changed their timeline to fit that they were at the store with their son. And they saw someone there looking at him over their coffee cup. Um, and they just thought it was odd. Okay, so you, you get back into your truck. It's 30 minutes to the campsite from that store. What did he do? Fly? So, you know, I don't know. Small area, shallow, shallow creek. In that one picture, I think I put up here, you can see the reservoir. Let me show you the reservoir. It's, it's right, it's very close. So the, the campsite is that green clearing and then that's the reservoir but supposedly it was only uh about three or, or four feet deep but they had divers in there they had people searching um the the creek with wetsuits on and, and so on and so forth so forth you see where they had the dogs um let me see if i can get put up some other search pictures So, yeah, they had a lot of people in the water, on the ground, in the air. They had drones. They had helicopters. Um, and a lot of these drones, you can program or you can buy these really upscale drones that will search for colors. So if he was wearing a camo jacket, blue jeans, whatever color the shoes were, you can set it to look for those colors and it will skim and look specifically for those colors. The helicopter had some heat, um, like infrared uh, device that you could immediately detect things. And in fact, some of these searches, they found remains. They found remains a couple of times um, in that area. They were not Dior's. Uh, one of the set of remains was not human. The other set uh, came back, it was not him. I don't know who it was, but it was not him. Um, the two parents have, uh, the, the parents of Dior have since separated. She remarried. Um, they both moved out of town. Um, as far as I can uh, tell, they did this interview in 2019.
and that is Kim Fields that did the interviews. Um, but I'm jumping ahead, but uh, let me see what I've missed so far. Um, the private investigator said in 2016 that he went, and this was reported by KBOI, that he went to the old apartment where the two had been evicted or if you, whatever news source, one says she abandoned the apartment, another says they were evicted, but the story is they lost their jobs and that's not too hard to believe. Lost their jobs, got kicked out of the apartment, couldn't afford the rent, um, just completely broke off the engagement split. Um, that part, you know, you, you can believe that. But anyway, um, he said that uh, they found the missing jacket, the toys at the old apartment. The landlord let them go in and, and, and you know, dig up the old apartment. A lot of the furniture and stuff was gone. The landlord threw it out. But what they did find this is what the private investigator is saying, the one I mentioned before. That supposedly he found the jacket um, and the, the matchbox cars the, that they said that he was supposedly wearing. And they turned it over to the police department um, where did, they didn't find the boots. He, he's, you know, obviously. And the camo jacket, he could have had more than one. Um, but I'm thinking in that first picture that I posted of him, he's in the camo jacket, the blanket, that's his blanket. His mother's holding it in the first interview. He's got a sippy cup and, um, the monkey. So what he found in the, in the apartment, he found a credit card that was used by family friend with seemingly purchases of items unknown to investigators and testimony. What does that mean? Found an insurance tracking device box along with instructions all turned over to the uh, Lehigh County Sheriff's Office. He searched five days with cadaver dogs. He hit on five different targets, including a site three quarters of a mile from Leodore Campground. Um, he said he believed that, that where that dog hit was a holding site for a body before it was moved to its final destination. So this website is kind of uh, vizaka.com. Um, the family members have reported that the decision to go camping was sudden and immediate. Um, but later on, we found out that grandpa's the one that wanted to go. The dad was hoping that the mom would say she didn't want to go. Um, so they would have to go. That's their story today or in 2019. That was their story. Um, but they went. So when they arrived, they put up the chairs, they put up the tent, they started a fire. Um, and then the next day, Grandpa goes to the trailer, leaves the door open. Supposedly, Ryan Wan went fishing alone, he says, and returned after Dior was missing. But they've all since changed that story. Mitchell shouts to Grandpa, they're leaving and Dior's being left behind. He says he didn't hear that. And he wasn't aware that, that Dior was there and he was responsible. According to Lehigh County Sheriff uh, Lynn Bowerman at the time, Jessica and Dior Sr. were walking down to a stream near the campsite to fish with Rhinewand. Dior Jr. accompanied the three. So was he running behind them? Um, you see how the story shifts? Like <clears throat> the parents say, they weren't with the friend. The friend had gone fishing, but then you hear that he was back there with Grandpa the whole time. And then again, Walton, the Grandpa, said he saw the, saw the kid near the stream. So every account of what happened that, that day is different. Um, initially, both parents declined the polygraph, but eventually... Um, all of them took polygraphs. The parents were listed as suspects in January of 2016. And um, the sheriff, uh, Lynn Bowerman, said it had to be a homicide. <clears throat> Later on, you find out that they all, the, the two parents failed the polygraph. We don't know about the friend. I don't know if grandpa took a polygraph. 
but according to this source, he had taken, the father had taken five polygraphs, the mother had taken four. The mother passed the, the part of the, the setup part of the polygraph where they say, you know, what's your name? Um, were you at the campground on this day? Blah, 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 the, the setup questions, and then failed the rest of it. According to her, she said she, she passed, but it was like she didn't answer the questions correctly, but it was like a soft pass or something because she's a mother in distress. And um, the father, they, they only admit to taking one polygraph or maybe two, but according to this report, he failed all five polygraphs even the question, I think this is from the PI, even the questions asking him what his name was. So, um, uh, yeah, it was Philip Klein. He's the head of that, that Klein Investigations. Um, I believe he's the one that commented on, on the, uh, the polygraphs. Um, the parents, Mitchell and Coons, they attempted to take the whole, the, the Klein um, investigator to court. They had three lawsuits. Uh, they lost all three lawsuits. The final lawsuit was October 2019. Uh, the investigator said he has an opinion of how it happened, but they don't, he doesn't know why. And then this investigator said that the mom said the dad was capable of hurting his son. Uh, Klein says, yeah, she is too. And then there was another, uh, David Marshburn PI. He became in, in, uh, engaged in the search and he's the co-founder of Search for Me Foundation in April of 2019. I don't know what happened with that. I don't know if he was hired or if he just showed up on his own. Um, in 2019, uh, HLN did the Real Life Nightmare series and there was also a movie, Missing 411, by David um, Paul Ides. Um, he was born in, on December 30th, 2012, in Idaho Falls. Reinwand insists that he had never met the couple, the parents of little Dior, before this camping trip. And when, and when his interviewer, who was Nate Eaton, Asked him, so you only knew him for a couple hours. He said, well, a couple days. So a couple of days would be, I guess, the trip to the camping site. And then the next day when he said to the mother of uh, Mitchell, he said, why'd you bring the kid? You know? So um, the PI says Dior Sr. took the poly, or he was interviewed nine times none matched or had been able to be verified the timeline of his uh of his story always falls apart like when they go to investigate to verify parts of his story it ends up not not jiving and and, and so it didn't add up mom gave five different stories which were different and never added up vernal had five polygraphs failed all five in the 99 percent, 99 uh, percentile, Jessica had four different tests and and failed. Um, according to the PI, Jessica told him she knows where the body is, but she would not go any further in that story. She said she was asked about that in the last interview with uh, Kim Fields, and she said, "I never said that. If I said that, I would have been arrested on the spot." She said, I never, ever would have said that. I never said it. Um, the grandpa uh, or the grandpa admits he believes there was an accident, but that's it. He won't go any further than that. Isaac Reinwand uh, stories are supposedly their vetting. But I, I've seen his stories. Like he was interviewed a couple of different times. Those have changed. And, and there's a lot of questions when asked he wouldn't answer. And in his interview on January 26th, 
2016 with Nate Eaton, Isaac Reinwan, the friend, was interviewed. So those are three different interviews. And in 2019, when they were doing this HLN story, um, he wouldn't answer the door. He still lives in the same place. He didn't answer the door to let them talk. But when um, Eaton, the, the uh, journalist, went up and knocked on the door, he opened it a crack and said he didn't want to talk about it. He said a few things, but um, but he, he did talk three different times. Um, and so to say that he vetted, I, I find that strange, but here, the um, interview with Isaac Reinwand with Nate Eaton on January 26 went like this. He won't answer what happened up there. He said, I declined to comment. Only says he saw Dior. He did say he saw Dior up there. Says grandpa had been a good friend to him. He said that he and the grandpa spent a couple of days out there when asked, um, so you only knew them a couple of hours. He said a couple of days. Asked if he was fishing, he said, uh, well, um, can't say. Um, let's see, where is the rest of this exciting interview? That was it. That was all I guess I garnered from that, from that, because it was fairly short. But I'll put the links down below. You can go watch him speak. Um, he doesn't come across like the brightest bulb in the pack, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, so in the Kim Fields, uh, interview with KTVB four years later, both of the parents in separate interviews are pointing at the friend saying he had to have something to do with it, they think. Um, and that's where she revealed like he never helped them search. He stayed in his tent. He drank a lot of beer. He complained about the kid. Um, and this is where they also said, yeah, they absolutely understand why people would look at them like they're guilty. If I looked at me, nah, I, that I totally don't understand. She said her stories differed uh, over the years because of shock, because she blocked stuff out. She doesn't remember everything. Um, And then she said she wasn't lying. And when asked about Klein, the investigators, she chuckled. You know, she laughed at that and was like, uh, you know, I wouldn't believe him. And she denies everything. And the dad said, I wouldn't trust him to find a dog in an empty parking lot or something weird like that. She never said, I know where the body is. The current sheriff um, said he doesn't call the parents suspects because they were called suspects, but this, the, you know, they've changed sheriffs, I believe, two times since then. The first one, then there was two more since then. The current sheriff said, I don't, um, I don't call them suspects. And I, I have a Pinner, I think is his name. I think it's Pinner, Sheriff Pinner. Um, oh, another thing that the mom said was very suspicious about, oh, crap, I forgot to put my garbage out. Another thing that the um, mom said was strange is that the friend had uh, factory resets on his phone three times since Dior went missing. Um, he wouldn't say if he passed the polygraph and he would say, I don't have a comment when asked if he thinks, uh, you know, that uh, Dior is still alive. Um, so uh, grandpa, Via his daughter said, I'm said that grandpa said, I'm sorry. I took my eyes off him, said he doesn't remember much, just him playing in the dirt and eating candy. And then of course Bobby the Searcher was was interviewed in the the new uh nightmare real life nightmare series and said he scoured I think it was in that or was a different video. But he scoured, the, every inch of that campground was scoured, uh, and 
the the whole bear animal wildlife was doubtful because of all the things I had talked about before. The, the mom says she goes to the campground once a year and she said she hates it up there, but it makes her feel closer to her son. Yeah, Steve Pinner is the new sheriff he was of as of 2019. Um, it's a it's it's a wild mystery. Um, there's a Facebook page is set up. There's a, with the investigator. He said when he goes back in and when he resumes his investigation, he's not going to give any tips. He's not going to say anything to the public until it's resolved. Uh, that last interview they did, both the mom and dad, I think the dad mostly said, you hang tight, wait and see. It's about, you know, I'm about to be like exonerated or something like that. But nothing came of it. There's still, there's still uh, no resolution to this. Um, it, it's, it just blows my mind. And we don't know about the friend the grandpa has since passed away the great-grandfather um that's it we don't know anything about anything and i think the private investigator my opinion just kind of threw off the investigation um by talking about it he could have been collecting evidence or doing his searches and whatever he does and just keeping him his notes and videos and pictures to himself, sharing them with the police department. Um, I, I just think going to the meeting, it's just, it's just weird. The whole thing is weird to me. The PI in the Daniel Robinson case did the same thing. And it stirs up the public, it stirs up the, the media. And, and there is one thing the dad is right about, little Dion's dad. He said, when the PI announced that we were suspects, that we murdered our son, basically the searches kind of started to dissipate. Um, and he said he feels like that that threw off any kind of investment. People stopped looking. But there's some very strange things. If he was abducted, where did this abductor come from? Like, why would you say that? without flushing that out. Even as, as the parent, the grandparent, the the friend, if you're trying to say maybe he was abducted, why? Was there another car in the area? Did you hear another car? Did you see? Because you would see a car pull up. Why, why would you even put that out there as a possibility? Why would someone say that? So, but there's, there's a ton. I'm going to put those links down below.